I hope that you realize that I am trying to model a way of looking at Scripture. And uh, that is why I'm moving through a book like 1 Peter. Because I, I, I really feel like we abuse the Bible when we pull little parts of it out and make it fit in ways that may fit modern 21st century Baptist life, but really don't fit context or the original hearers. And I think we, I think we damage the Word of God when we put too much of our agenda onto this ancient book. And the only way to really understand uh, the intent of the original author is to follow their presentation at paragraph level. And I would say to you, this paragraph I'm going to do has some really, really interesting stuff. I mean, really. Some things that uh, are only mentioned here in this paragraph, but they are not the central truth of the paragraph. They have caused thousands of theological pages to be written, but they are not the intent of the original author. Now, they're interesting, and I'm going to mention them as I pass through. I would say to you, as you, I hope you have your Bibles open. hope you brought your Bibles. This is church, uh, 1 Peter 3, and I'm going to be dealing with 13 through 22. 13 through 22. As you read this, and I hope you knew I was going to do this. I've been doing this every Sunday for, for months now, going through the next paragraph in 1 Peter. The thing you ought to first say to yourself is, have I read the book of 1 Peter? You can read the book of 1 Peter in a short time. You need to read the whole book. You cannot understand what the part means unless you've read the whole. And then you have to say to yourself, what is this paragraph about? If I had to put it in one sentence, not every wonderful, neat, theological rabbit I want to chase, what is this paragraph about? Now, I don't think I want to tell you that. Remember, <laughs> the Bible throws a lot of light on commentaries and preachers. Amen? <laughs> and just because I think it means this or that, that's not the issue. The issue is, what do you think it means? You the Holy Spirit and the Bible are priority. You, the Holy Spirit and the Bible are priority. You're going to stand before God for what you believe the Bible says and how you've lived it. And please don't mention my name. I'm in enough trouble already. <laughs> Let's look at this together. Let's move through this. Who is there to harm you? Now, I hope that you have a reference Bible. In the margin, you will note that this is a quote, at least an allusion to Psalm 118. Now, this is one powerful psalm. This has been alluded to earlier in 1 Peter. This is the cornerstone text. This is from Isaiah 8, Isaiah 28, and Psalm 118, where this whole concept of the stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This is the whole context about Jesus, the living stone, the, the center pillar this is all these texts. So we're, we're alluding to that. And in this text, what are we thinking about now? Who is there to harm you? Who was this book written to? A church in great prosperity, a church in great um, peril. First Peter seems to be written to a church in peril, a church in persecution, a church in disarray, a church in the fog of a fallen world. And into to, to all the confusion that comes to the people of God, Peter, by the Spirit of God, wants to remind us of some things in the midst of the fog. This sermon I could have called in the midst of the fog. <laughs> all of us are in the fog. The fog of what? The fog of daily life, the fog of a fallen world, the fallen of a fallen self. We look at life and, you know, the older I get, the more I feel comfortable writing mystery across my experiences because I do not understand why and how and all of that. And I, I'm sure you do too. So I think it is somewhat ironic. And I think what I'm saying, God is going to promise, now listen to me, God is going to promise to protect those who are in the midst of suffering and dying. Oh, what a paradox. 
You mean those who are currently hurting, those who are currently be putting on trial for their faith, those who are currently suffering persecution from a lost world, that's the one that God promises to protect, and yet they're suffering currently, and yet God promises to protect them? That's the paradox of Christianity. Not a hair on my head falls that God doesn't know. But the Lord knows I've lost a lot. It's not your hair won't fall out. It's not you won't pull your own hair out. It's that God knows who you are, where you are, what's happening to you, is with you, will walk through it with you, but he doesn't promise to fix it for you. We think these texts promise him to change things. No, he promises to change you in the midst of things. It's quite different. And the truth is, the worst thing that could happen to most of us spiritually is an easy, calm, gentle, cultural Christianity. We are forced to grow in times of confusion, disarray, problems. We are forced, forced to fly our true colors. And our true colors are him. And when the world sees those true colors, the world is impressed. Because the world wants an easy, what's in it for me? What do I get out of it? Kind of religious experience. And what Jesus promises, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Now that surprises us in America because we've had it so easy here for so many generations. But I guarantee you, the church of Jesus Christ in the world of the 20th and 21st century is a church that has died more in the last century than any Christians in any generation. So please don't tell me that you uh, just don't like the air conditioner or the pew's not the right thickness or the church needs to be painted or they didn't quite mow all the lawn. You spoiled turkey blossom. I'm over it. If you prove zealous for what is good. Now, there's a several conditions through here. These, these Greek conditions are in your English text as if. And there are surprise, su surprising ones in here, so I want to mark these with you. There in verse 13, there is, there is a conditional statement. If, this is a third class conditional, which speaks of potential action. Now, it doesn't speak of certainty. It doesn't speak of certainty for two reasons. Every Christian is not zealous for good. No, there are some Christians that are floating through life. And a little bit later, not every Christian is going to suffer. I, I do, you know, Peggy and I discuss the world seems so in such pain, in such hunger. The church seems in such crisis. And we seem to have it so easy. Lord, I feel guilty that I have it so easy. I'm not supposed to feel guilty that I have it easy. I'm supposed to be ready at any moment for whatever comes, and I can't control that. I can't control when problems come. I can't control when prosperity comes. I have already a settled disposition, worldview of whatever comes. We need to be able to face it in Him. Amen? It's the in Him that's the key, not the conditional circumstances. They may come. God, have mercy. They do come, but they don't come to every Christian. And they don't come in every age. So, there, 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 is, there is some flex here. And um, the flex surprises me. Because, and I've said to you before, sometimes we try to uh, interpret this in light of God loves these people and doesn't love these people. I think that's a terrible evaluation because that seems to say that prosperity is the blessing and problems are the curse. Now, that is an Old Testament model from Deuteronomy 27 and 28. But this is not the Old Testament. This is not the Old Testament. And if problems are a sign of sin, what do you do with Jesus Christ and the apostles? No, 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 no. If you let circumstances determine your peace, you're about 10 seconds away from being stripped of your peace. But if you let him determine your peace, irregardless of circumstances, no one or no thing can rob that peace from you. Amen? You do know the ending paragraph of Romans chapter 8, don't you? That great scene, that court scene with God as the, as the judge and Jesus as the defense lawyer and Satan as the prosecuting attorney. If God be for us, finish it with me. Now, do we live that or just say that? That's the issue. 
That's the issue. That's the issue. Be zealous for what is good. Well, I think we could debate what does is, what is good mean. I've often thought about what does good mean. I think for my life, and this has been a, a major theological uh, truth that has come to me, I, I for years have loved Romans 8, 28. God causes all things to work together for. And then the two conditions, those who love God and on. But, and I've always thought, what is the good there, though? Is good the health, wealth, and prosperity preaching that dominates the American airways? If you look at Romans 8, 29, the good is defined. The good that God promises to those who love him is the good of verse 29, that we be conformed to the image of his son. That's the good. And if Jesus is the model, that, that does not come without problems and persecution. Maturity, spiritual maturity, does not come without problems and persecution. We are seeking for an easy believism and an easy Christian life, and both of them are false promises. False promises. But even if, verse 14, you should suffer, this if here is a fourth class conditional sentence, much rarer than the third. The third is the predominant condition of the New Testament. This is a rare one, often used of wishes or request. It's, it's the farthest removed from possibility of the four Greek conditions. If it happens to happen that, that's what it means, don't go seeking persecution like the early church fathers, prove how spiritual you are. We don't seek persecution. But whenever it comes in a fallen world where we must stand up for the cause of Christ, stand up for the King of Kings, stand up for our faith in Him, whatever it costs, we're ready to do it. We're ready to do it. Ready to do it in court. Ready to do it in the marketplace. Ready to do it wherever we're called upon to say who we are in Him and that he is priority, commitment of our life. And it will come in different ways for different folks. I, every Christian will not suffer, but every Christian has to be ready to suffer. Every Christian will not be taken to court for being a Christian, but every Christian needs to be ready to give an account of the hope that's in them. And this hope is not, I, I, because of my great commission heart, Many years in my preaching life, I used this as a call for daily personal evangelism, that every member should be a verbal witness. And I still believe that. But this text, in context, is really not about that Great Commission. This text, in context, is about Christians being put on trial, put on trial for being a Christian. And when they are put on trial, they give a powerful spirit-led witness to their faith in Christ as Paul did in Acts and as others did through Christian history. So here we have a text. Peter writing to a group that's being persecuted and to them he says, persecutions will come. I still go back to Romans 8, 17. We will reign with him if we suffer with him. John 15, verse 20. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Why does that surprise us? We need 1 Peter in our world. 1 Peter is written to a group of persecuted Christians to hang in there. I'm in control. I'm with you. This will work out for my kingdom and my glory. Trust me in the midst. Might be a good name for 1 Peter. Might be a good name. Um, the next, next little thing that catches me, you are blessed. Now, that surprised me because this is the word blessed. This is not the word eulogy used always of God. This is the word of the Beatitudes. Blessed are they who, which speaks about the blessings or, of a Christian life. So you mean I am blessed? And how am I blessed in the midst of persecution? How am I blessed? Were the prophets accepted or persecuted? Were the prophets accepted or persecuted? Was Jesus accepted or persecuted? Was the early apostles accepted or persecuted? I want to be with them. Put me in with the Old Testament prophets, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the apostles. 
If their life was a life not of gentility and abundance, not of outward peace and physical prosperity, but a life of intimacy with God, which every one of us desires more than anything, and yet we've missed that in America. Put me with them. Put me with them. Do not fear. This, again, is another allusion to the Old Testament. I hope you have a Bible that shows you Old Testament allusions in small caps. If you don't, get another Bible. Just because you got that at your wedding, your mother gave it to you, there's maybe more better ones out there. Besides, it doesn't match your current shoes. This goes back to Isaiah chapter 8. Now, I don't know exactly what their fear means. Is it the fear that persecutors cause? Is it fear like fallen people feel in the dark of night when their own uncertainty and doubt overwhelm them? I'm not sure I know exactly what this fear is, but I have experienced fear in my life, and I still do. And it's a sign that I do not have an intimacy with him because as intimacy with God cast out all fear. First John. No, I, I do still fear. I think you still fear. But I want to fear less. I want to fear less. I, I want to be delivered from the fear of lack of or fear of what if. I need to be ready to by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit, in a knowledge of the Word of God, I need to be ready to face whatever comes. But I need to quit worrying about the what-ifs, about what might come. And I want to tell you the book that has helped me so much. It's kind of a hard book to work through in some ways, but oh, my soul, is it worth it? it, it we all wonder, why this? Why me? Why now? I mean, it's just a common thing in the, in the fog of a fallen world, even for believers. This little book is written by a Quaker lady, 1800s, Hannah Whithall Smith, The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. I've mentioned that several times to you, but... I, I don't see any of you write it down, and none of you told me you read it. You say, I, Bob, I enjoy what you, what you say, and, well, <laughs> there's no test. But if, I, if, if you like what I say, I think maybe you ought to look at the book. Get it from the library. They got it. Scholar told me you could borrow his for $7.95 a week. Under this uh, verse 15, but sanctify, this is an aorist imperative, this is a decisive act, this is a completed act, sanctify. Now, what does that word sanctify mean? Well, that's the same root as holy, same root as uh, sanctification, same root as set apart to. Now, what, what, is, what does a Christian mean? When, what, what does this mean? Peter says to the believers, sanctify. What is, it, what is he saying to them? Well, you remember that Jesus, in his great high priestly prayer of John 17, said, I sanctify myself for them. Now, Peter is calling on us to mimic Christ's experience of living a holy life for others. You catch the, you catch the flow here? We are to mimic. I would say the three reasons that Jesus came, once he came to die... He, 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 we couldn't deal with that sin problem. He could. He came to fully reveal the Father because the Father is personal and he can't be revealed completely in a book. And he came, number three, to give us an example to follow. Jesus is what we could have been in the Garden of Eden to some extent and what we will be to some extent once we're with him. He is the fullness of what humanity was meant to be. He is the epitome of the dignity of the human race, that God will become one of us and stay one of us for eternity. So we are to mimic the kind of self-sacrifice for the good of others to bring them to God that Jesus exemplified, which was the task of Israel. And she failed. Now we're asking, is the church going to fail that living a holy life in an unholy world? Yes, she is failing, but we're called to it.
We're called to it. If you look at this text for a minute, I would just say to you, what, what, what basically does this sanctify mean in very practical terms? Well, in verses 8 and 9, it means to love one another. In verses 13 and 14, it means to live our lives in such a holy way. And in verse 15, it means a verbal witness if we're called on to give it. These are very practical ways. Be ready to make a defense, a legal defense. Exactly, this is the word apologia. You've heard it, we get apology from it in the sense of a, a legal defense in the book of Acts. We need to be ready. Have you thought through what you would say if? And of course the problem is we have not. Because for the vast majority of the church of Jesus Christ, let me just fuss a minute, I, don't, I forgot how many Baptists it takes to win one soul to Christ a year, but it is absolutely shameful. The percentage of Baptists that are verbal witnesses in any situation, in any given year or decade, is abysmal. We speak with our mouth and live a totally different agenda with our lives. We say he's everything and we will never mention his name out of fear or shame or whatever. It's not good, brothers. It's not good. And we're to do this with gentle and reverence, not with antagonism, not with winning the argument, not with I know more than you know, not with a sense of superiority. We are beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. Amen? None of us have arrived. None of us have truth and knowledge. We share what we can with a world that has nothing. Keep a good conscience. Well, the word conscience is such a terrible, hard word to define. Terribly hard. First of all, there's no Old Testament equivalent to the word conscience, unless maybe breast is. And the problem with conscience is that the conscience can be, can be programmed by the Spirit of God or the Spirit of the world are the personal preferences of the person. And I would say to you, I Baptist, I think that many of you have a conscience programmed by Baptist traditions, not the Bible. You have a, you're, you're sensitive to certain things that have nothing to do with godliness and everything to do with human traditions. And the tragedy is we don't know the difference. Reminds me again of Isaiah 29, 13. I hope you'll look it up. These people worship me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And their worship consists in things learned by rote memory from traditions. Now, we don't spit, dance, and chew. God forbid. But we don't share our faith and love one another either. Give me a Coors beer with somebody who loves me. Deliver me from a total abstainer, mean-spirited person. I'm over it. I've found in my life, I was in a bar a lot more years than I was in a church as a young person. I found far more fellowship in bars than I did in legalistic, judgmental churches. We think we're self-righteous and God throws up on our legalism. You can't, have a, you can't have a godly conscience without a biblical worldview, i.e., knowing Scripture. You can't have a godly conscience without an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ daily. Prayer. You cannot have a godly conscience without living out what you believe in practice of spirituality. It's not what we think is right, it's what we do that God really looks at. He certainly looks at the heart and the mind, but too many of us have a good heart and a good mind and absolutely no fruit. Fruit up. Then we're coming to Christ's death. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, let me just take a bit more. So that in, in, in the things in which you were slandered, now if you I hope you remember the sermons I did earlier where they were, the Christians were accused of so many things in the ancient world. I hope you'll go back to chapter 2, verse 12 and 15. They were, they were accused of cannibalism. They were accused of atheism. They were accused of all kinds of terrible things because of misunderstanding of liturgy and traditions. And then verse 17, if God should will it so. Now the first, fourth class condition, some Christians suffer, some do not. I do not know why. 
Verse 18. For Christ also died for sins. Now this, this is a powerful text on substitutionary atonement. Uh, this text is used in the Septuagint, this phrase, for a sin offering. I would think of 2 Corinthians 5.21. God took him who knew no sin and made him become a sin offering that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now there's some hair pull here on what prepositions here, but I think this is substitutionary atonement uh, any way you go with it. And notice, if you remember the book, the study of Hebrews that we're doing on Sunday night, kind of pause right now for the holiday season, I guess, but if you remember the once and for all, he died once and for all. He doesn't die over and over. He's the supreme high priest that went into the heavenly tabernacle offering the ultimate sacrifice of himself once and for all. Amen? The boy ain't going to die anymore. He's alive and he'll never die again. The just for the unjust. This is the sinlessness of Christ. This is the Hebrew concept of corporality. Achan sinned and the Israeli army lost the battle. Adam sinned and the human race fell. Jesus died and the human race has potential for salvation, all of them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In order that he might bring us to God. Now this is that Hebrews word of access, personal introduction to, an intimacy. I would be so bold as to make this theological statement. Believers in Christ now, immediately, have the potential of the intimacy of fellowship with God that Adam and Eve experienced in the Garden of Eden. Because I believe that salvation is the restoration of the damaged image and likeness. Now, we don't see him face to face yet. And we don't have the glorious fellowship of the saints of all the ages. And we don't have a complete understanding without our eyes being clouded. But when we bow our heads in prayer, we are in the throne room of the king of the universe. And you can bow your prayer head any time you want and fellowship with him. Woo, what a powerful, powerful. Now comes this, this, this rather difficult, and I'm going to touch this quickly. I have a theological opinion on this. I have pages of commentary on this. I have theory after theory of what this means. This is one of those things we get caught up in, miss the whole flow of godly living, and get off in to who and when did Jesus preach to the spirits in prison. I wish I knew. I'm going to slap Peter. He didn't write more, clearer. Come on, Peter, what are you talking about? But I don't know. I'm not sure. I assume that this is talking about the time between his death on the cross and whenever he came out some 30-something hours later from the tomb. I assume that's what it is. I assume he went to Hades, the holding place of the dead, the New Testament equivalent to Sheol. I assume he preached to somebody. Now, who did he preach to? Well... Did, did he preach judgment? Did he preach salvation? Is this a second chance? Is this a condemnation of a certain group? These are all theories. It looks to me like you cannot read this text and out, and without taking it back to Noah's day. Somehow this is connected to Noah's day. Look at your text. Now, who have I got in Noah's day? Did he preach redemption to the eight in the ark? Noah and his family that were obedient. Yes, it could be, could be it. Could he have preached to those people who Noah preached to for 120 years and not one of them believed? Yes, he could have preached to them. My personal preference is that there is a group of half-human, half-angels called the Nephilim that he preached to them. That first Enoch, which was very influential in the early church, believed that these disembodied, large-bodied people are the demons of the New Testament. There's so much controversy here. I hope you'll go online to my commentary on Genesis 6 if you want all the details and all the footnotes. And the same here if you want all the possible theory. Do not let this red herring, which nobody really knows, take you away from the Holy Spirit's call to sanctify yourself. This may win Bible trivia, but this won't win the world. This may make you look intelligent, but this does not promote godliness. So, interesting, yes, uh, theologians love it, but, but what is the purpose of the paragraph? Well, I wish I knew. Now, many have said, 
that the first Peter is a baptismal sermon. Now, the reason they say that is because of this text right here, this, this paragraph right here. For some reason, woo, 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 Peter is bringing stuff from Noah's day and, 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 and uh, he's bringing all kinds of allusions here. And you ask yourself, why Peter? What is the purpose of this illusion? Well, I, I'm not sure I know. It seems to be a play on water. The flood of Noah's day, baptism in Jesus' day. Now, exactly how P Peter put that together, why Peter put that together, I'm not sure. But I want to say a few words about baptism. Look at 21, verse 21. I do not believe that baptism is a sacrament. I do not believe we're lost or saved based on baptism, okay? But that is not meant for you to hear me say that baptism is not the will of God for every believer. That is not for you to, it, it, to say that we can argue over how and when of baptism and it makes no difference. I am committed personally to believer's baptism. I don't care how. You can dunk them, sponge them, sprinkle them, put the hose on the brother. I don't care how. I don't care exactly what the formula is. I don't care exactly who the person is that does it. I care a whole lot about the heart of the person receiving it. Do they know they're lost? Do they know that Jesus died for them? Do they know that he's offered salvation to whosoever will? These, to me, are the critical issues of baptism. Now, people are always asking me, do I have to be baptized to be saved? That is the stupidest question I've ever heard. Anybody in the New Testament would look at you and their eyes would cross. Boing, boing, boing. How would anybody ask that question to anybody? If Jesus did it and Jesus commanded it, what in the world are you asking me, should I? Now, we can argue over how and when and who and where and all of that. Fine, fine. Baptism was important to Jesus. It was important to the Great Commission. It was important to the Apostle Peter. And it ought to be important to the church of Jesus Christ. Now, the thief on the cross, it's kind of hard for him to do it. I don't think God is going to... I think the key is the heart, not the ritual. But that is not meant to depreciate the significance of the ritual when it's possible by faith. Hope you hear what I'm saying. Now, this deal about uh, angels and authorities and powers are subject to him in verse 22. First of all, I want to tell you this is anthropomorphic language because God is not sitting on a throne. The created order is his throne. God is a spirit, not a person in the sense of a body. He is spread throughout the universe. Please don't tell me you expect an old guy, a young guy on a gold chair surrounded by a flying white bird. Please tell me you don't believe that. When we talk about the right hand, we're talking about a metaphor of power, preeminence, and authority. Power, preeminence, and authority. And even in English, we say, that's my right hand man. That's an indispensable person. That's who Jesus Christ is. Now, what is this? Angels, authorities, and powers are subject to him. Well, first of all, I think this adds credence to my understanding of angels back in the allusion to Noah, by the way. But secondly, Peter is written in an age where Gnosticism is, be is becoming the plague of the early church. Gnosticism was the battle and enemy of the first two centuries of Christianity. Now, this is the Nag Hammadi text from Egypt in Coptic that you know as the Gospel of Thomas, which has caused all the row in the Da Vinci Code thing. These were people who were Greek thinkers who had took Christian vocabulary and used it in different ways. But, but Paul quite often addresses this, and I think Peter is addressing this here. Between a holy God and who could, who's so holy he couldn't personally touch or or transform or anything else sinful matter is a series of angelic levels or eons. 
And for these Gnostics, the way to be saved is not Jesus dying for them, but their secret knowledge about these angelic spheres. And the Greek word to describe all of these spheres is the Greek word pleroma, filled heaven, the fullness. Those are the words. This is saying when Jesus went through the heavens, i.e. these angelic spheres, all of them are subject to him. He has totally overcome. He is the creator of the visible and the invisible. Colossians 1. And he is the victor of both. And all things are subject to him. And God desires in the, in the wonder of his mercy that humans rebelling from him would yield themselves and return to the intimate fellowship of God's will in his creation of them. And that refers to each one of you individually. You know, I love that poem. That's, it's, kind of, it's kind of somewhat gross. Uh, it's the English poem describing God as the hound of heaven. God as a bloodhound. You think, oh, that's, that's, that's just that's terrible. Well, the point is that God's on the trail of every individual human being made in the image and likeness of himself, the image and likeness of Adam. And through sin and rebellion and confusion and decades, this, this bloodhound is on the trail seeking intimate fellowship with a creation that he longs to know and love. God does not give up on people. People give up on God. And I don't know who you are of what you've done, but I want you to know the sinless one died in your place. And the sinless one wants you to live as he lived so that others might come to know him in intimate, daily fellowship. And that everything we do and everything we have is not for personal ownership or personal stewardship. We are stewards of everything and owners of nothing biblically. And our lives do not belong to us because we have been bought with a price. Hello, First Peter. Glorify God in your bodies. Do you hear this paragraph? Sanctify yourself. Be a part of the persecuted ones because the persecuted ones are the ones that belong to him. And he has overcome every obstacle in the spiritual realm, and the physical realm, and he bids you come. Will you stand with me, please? I don't know why you're here today, friend, guest, stop by, but I know this for you. You're not by here by accident. God in Christ loves you. Jesus died for you. Whosoever will can trust him. And beyond trust in him, there's the issue of service, the issue of godliness, the issue of relating to a body of Christians to serve Jesus in a community. And I call on you, if you have not dealt with him as Savior, come, let us show you in the scripture text. We're not asking you to agree with us on every point. We're not even asking you to join our church. We're asking you to give us the privilege of showing you from scripture that whosoever will may come in the finished work of Christ. If you've done that, then I say to you, God is calling you to sanctified living. He's calling you to service. He's calling you to live for others. He's calling you to lay down yourself and pick up his mantle and serve one another. And anything less than that is a tragedy to the price paid for redemption. May we pray. Lord, you know who's here. You know their hearts. I pray that your Holy Spirit will have freedom Freedom that comes apart from traditions. Freedom that comes from only your love and power. We pray today that we would be people, subservient, available to the call to holiness and service and Christ likeness. Forgive us for dogmatic, denominational, cultural Christianity. Help those who know us know that something is different about us because we've been with you that something is different about us in the priorities of our life. And we pray sincerely, O oh God, that something would be different about us in Jesus' name.